Skis, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the GX Hockey Cast. We're on episode 75. Toronto Maple Leafs legend player Ryan Reeves. Of my little hockey show, where once a week I go through all of the major news and what's going on in the NHL, mainly focusing in on the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Calgary Flames. Those are my favorite teams, but I will be talking about all 32 of these NHL teams. Not every single episode, that'd be that'd be bananas, but mostly we'll be talking about a whole bunch of hockey stuff. So what's on tap for this week? I mean, we got a huge oil change in Edmonton. That shit was crazy. Calgary's doing some stuff. We got Toronto news, of course. We got some teams on major losing streaks. We got a Canadian team that just seems dominant, but will that domination end at some point? I don't know. Patrick Kane is uh, getting hunted on by a certain team. We'll be talking about that. And quite possibly, the biggest news of the entire season, the San Jose Sharks have won a game. All right, so let's dive into this. I think we're going to have to start with the Edmonton Oilers. Because, I mean, yeesh, what a, just a nightmare. But honestly, now that uh, the big nasty band-aid, sadly, the sacrificial lamb of the Edmonton Oilers has to be Poor Jay Woodcroft. So the Edmonton Oilers have fired Jay Woodcroft as the head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. And yeah, it really, really sucks, man. He is definitely, in my opinion, I feel like most people's opinion right now, uh, he is not the guy to blame for the Edmonton Oilers' struggles out of the gate this season. But there is an immense amount of pressure around the Edmonton Oilers this season. They got the arguably the two greatest players in the game right now, both playing on the team. Uh, We're still looking for that success. There hasn't been a Stanley Cup in Edmonton since the Gretzky era and and I guess Mark Messier as well. And the pressure is on, man. A lot of expectation on this team coming in. Stanley Cup favorites, contenders. I thought they were going to be great. Everyone thought there was they were going to be great. I didn't hear a single opinion about the Edmonton Oilers. And out of the gate, they the shocking thing is they're right there. Not so much right at this moment, but they were right there with the San Jose Sharks. Even losing to the San Jose Sharks. And that sadly looked like that was the final nail in the coffin for Jay Woodcroft tons of eyes on that game probably going to be the most eyes on a San Jose game this season I would think but yeah that was an absolute disaster and people are you know they saw Woodcroft and I don't have the name of the sadly the other uh, assistant coach or uh, another uh bench coach or something Oilers also firing him as well they were both discussing on the bench some people thinking that they said oh we're we're done basically and yeah I mean it's it sucks it really is honestly I think Ken Holland the GM of the Edmonton Oilers should be like he should be gone but he will be next but we'll we'll talk about Holland in a moment but Jay Woodcroft man he's He's had the best winning record in Edmonton Oilers history, I do believe. Now, it's not the longest track record, but history shows there <laughs> there's not been a lot of coaches that that last very long with Edmonton. I believe what is the stat now? Over the last 10 seasons, they've had 15 coaches or or it might be switched. 15 seasons, 10 coaches. Regardless, that is an outrageous amount of turnaround of coaches and The crazy thing is, poor Ryan Nugent Hopkins has been there for all of those coaching changes. And I want to shout out the Nuge for even producing that 100-point season last year when he did. I mean, it's almost nothing short of a miracle. I mean, for a while there, it almost looked like he was just 
going to go, not maybe, not necessarily the way of Yakupov, where he's just out of the league and done, one of the worst busts of all time, but it didn't look like it was going to be very successful with Ryan Nugent Hopkins, and man, did it ever, it felt really good to see him hit that 100-point season. Now, he's having a solid season right now, not not necessarily up to the point um, that he was putting up last year, but that's a really high bar. That's more than likely going to be a career year for him, but he's still on pace, I believe, for in and around a point a game, which is fantastic. So anyway, enough of Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Just I, I think he's awesome. I, I really like him a lot. And um, since I'm talking about him, there are now just speculations if the Oilers... Uh, this is mostly just up in the air. They're discussing it on Chicklets. But if if there was a piece on the on the Edmonton Oilers that could get traded, they were thinking that Nugent Hopkins could be the best piece. He's on a nice contract. He's only making five point one two five. Somehow he takes a discount on the previous contract of six million, which is insane. Puts up a hundred points. Now he looks like. Uh, he could have some of the best value on the Oilers uh, this season, uh, aside from the superstars on that team, obviously. But uh, it was it was very interesting that they brought that up, and like uh, they think that it wouldn't be too bad of a hit on their offense. You, know, you still have McDavid and Drysaitel, obviously, who you know they have not been themselves uh, out of the gate. McDavid looks like he's still dealing with shit, and Drysaitel doesn't quite look like himself. Again, though, recently with the new coaching change, it's been better. I mean, thankfully. Oh, God. Can you imagine if they came out of the gate with a bunch of losses with the new coach? So, speaking of the new coach, it is uh, Chris Knobloch. Let me just get the notes up right here. Uh, Jay Woodcroft. Chris Knobloch is named the new head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, This has kind of been in the works for a little bit. Uh, Chris Knobloch has had interest around the league for a little bit now. He's been the head coach of the uh, the Hartford Wolfpack, I do believe, in the AHL, associated with the New York Rangers. And the Rangers, uh, to the surprise of some people, actually allowed the Oilers to speak with him, maybe doing uh, Knobloch a favor. They're like, okay, well, we're pretty set with our coach. We're in a great place. He wants to be in the NHL. There's an opportunity for him. Let's give it to him. So maybe that's what's going on. But regardless, Oilers get Chris Knobloch, and there's a lot of connections here with Connor McDavid. So Knobloch coached McDavid on the Erie Otters in the OHL in his uh, junior days. And yeah, they had a good relationship there. It seemed like he was getting a lot out of Connor McDavid and Connor Brown. And sadly, it doesn't look like the Connor Brown experiment is is. It looks like it's over, sadly. Uh, He didn't put up any points in the nine games. If he plays another game, then the $4 million bonus or cap hit gets uh, nailed onto the Oilers. And I don't think uh, they're willing to do that. You know, it sucks for Connor Brown that it didn't work out. But yeah, they're not willing to just throw up $4 million for a guy that's put up zero points so far. So sadly, that doesn't look like it's going to work out. But with Chris Knobloch... Um, I'm happy we got a new guy coming into the NHL. It's always good to see new names coming up and getting an opportunity. Always nice to see. And I don't like seeing rehash names all the time, especially if they don't have a, a good track record. Babcock, for example. So he's in there. So far, so good. They win the first game. They won a pretty wild game the other night against Seattle with uh, Evander Kane getting a natural hat trick. So... I mean, it was in the numbers that, you know, the Oilers are really snake bitten right now. Everything is going against them. Virtually zero bounces. Everything is going against them. But then there's some very obvious glaring things. The goaltending has been just abysmal. It's it's hard to avoid it saying anything other than it's just been abysmal. Jack Campbell getting sent down and it's not even like the poor guy, he, he's He didn't necessarily get shelled, but he let in four goals, I do believe, in his AHL game. So he's not even doing good down there. So it may take some time for Jack Campbell. I'm starting to think now this may end up going to like a buyout situation, which would suck. But it's pretty early and they feel like they want to give him some time down there to find his game. Uh, People said that. It was a shock to the system to Jack Campbell. Like, he was kind of surprised. He thought he was playing okay, and he was battling through it, but I guess not so much with the Oilers. And, you know, it may not necessarily be that he was playing. Like, he wasn't playing good, obviously, and 
Skinner's playing even worse, but Campbell has the big contract. Uh, They had to do something to shake up the roster, try and wake him up or something, because Jay Woodcroft uh, was saying that he didn't have the ability to bench any of the players because they were so up against the cap and the roster was so tight. So he wasn't even able to utilize some of that kind of stuff, coaching tricks that he could do to try and wake this team up. And yeah, it was just... It's just honestly, people are saying it was just the sadly, it was just awful timing, awful, awful timing for poor Woodcroft, man. Like the worst time to go on a losing streak and have the worst uh, streak of his career. And with all, it just, it sucks, man. And I know he's going to bounce back on his feet. I mean, with that record, there's going to be teams lining up. I mean, there's probably teams lined up at his door right now. He's probably maybe take a week, maybe not. Maybe he's already out there hunting. For another team to coach and, and show the Oilers like, oh, you fucked up. You shouldn't have fired me. And I hope he does that, honestly, because uh, I think he, it really sucks. It should be Ken Holland and Ken Holland, man. Jeez, uh, it's we're going to be talking about him in depth. I imagine that's very soon because he's on his last year of ruining the Edmonton Oilers and failing miserably to bring a team together around uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl and so we're not going to go in depth with the moves of what Holland has done today. Uh, we will at some point, but uh, yeah, man, it's it it seems clear as day that Holland is is the problem here in Edmonton, and maybe some other things in the background that we don't get to see. A lot of speculation of are there too many cooks in the kitchen? Meaning, like, are there too many guys back there with different ideas, different directions of where this team should go, and you're pulling in too many different directions, and the team doesn't know where to go. They they definitely look like they get locked up on the ice at times like especially defensively like they were playing around with some new defensive systems didn't work out now they're going back so there's definitely been a little bit of confusion for sure on the defensive end some I mean there's there there really there's not much way to explain it because uh, you don't just forget that like they just they look so brain dead at times on defense the Oilers but, uh, yeah, they've been playing around with systems. But Ken Holland, man, like, uh, Jesus, that guy needs to go. And I'm honestly a little bit surprised that he is, you know, allowed still to be doing moves, firing Woodcroft, s- sending down Campbell. Like, I'm surprised they're still letting him do things, uh, considering, like, it's not... It's all. It's not. Necess- it's not written in the sand. Confirmed that he will not be back as the GM. Uh, it just that is kind of like you need need to move on from this guy because he's he's toast. But I'm nervous that he's going to make a move or do something. Let's say if they do trade Nugent Hopkins, what if he just blows it and does something stupid like he did when he trades Strom for Spooner and he just downgrades and just blows the trade completely? Maybe he goes for like a really old veteran that's way past his prime and you're and you're sending over Nugent Hopkins who's who's in his prime still and can provide a lot for a lot of teams in the NHL. So it's it's a little nerve-wracking. Like I wouldn't want um Oh man, it's it's a tough spot to be. Like honestly, I wouldn't have fired Woodcroft if I was the owner in charge of the Oilers. It would have been Holland, but ugh, I don't know what's going on. Who's who would take over for the Oilers? And yeah, it's it's it sucks. It just really does suck. I feel so bad for Woodcroft that he's the sacrificial lamb for all this, but. So far, so good. Oilers are winning. Uh, you know, Evander Kane with the hat trick. Goaltending has been better. Defense has been better. Uh, they're trending upward, so it's not done for the Oilers yet. And not so much like with the Flames, where it just seems like, you know, the Flames don't have McDavid and Drysaddle on their team. And also with the McDavid thing, a lot of people are kind of throwing heat at McDavid. Actually, a lot of heat, honestly, at McDavid for a bunch of things. Uh, there, people are saying that McDavid runs the runs the team, kind of like how LeBron James was running teams in the NBA. Like, oh, I want that guy, I need that coach, I want this owner, and we're gonna we're gonna do this shit, and we're gonna win a championship. And the NHL doesn't necessarily work the same way as the NBA. It's a way bigger team sport. There's on the NBA, you got your starters and a few bench players, and in the NHL, you got lines of players, a lot more players, and a lot more involvement with those players. So it's definitely different does McDavid uh, have influence with the Oilers I mean I would you would have to think a little bit but is he in there kicking down the doors being like 
I want Knoblock. I need that block on the team. I need him. Fuck Woodcroft. Get him out of here. Like, he seemed to have a good relation with Woodcroft. I don't think that was the problem. I think it's the Oilers doing what they can right now uh, to please McDavid and Dreisaitl, honestly, because they're both uh, getting closer and closer to the end of those contracts, especially Dreisaitl. He is... This is the last year, I do believe, or he might have one more year after that. But it is getting close to contract uh, negotiation time with Dreisaitl. And if things didn't turn around quickly, if the Oilers continued to trend the way that they were trending, hanging out with the San Jose Sharks and the Calgary Flames at the bottom of the league, how into uh, sticking around with the Oilers is Leon Dreisaitl going to be, in all honesty? Would he take his ball and get the fuck out of here? Like, that's it. I've been here for eight plus years or whatever and we've had some success but there's just been too much inconsistency with the ownership and uh the the team getting built around us just hasn't been up to par and we can go somewhere else where maybe there's a little bit less heat and pressure on us and who knows that's just speculation at this point again oilers are trending upwards so Winning fixes everything, obviously. When you're winning, people are happy and problems go away. But right now, all of that is was very focused on oh, throughout this week. And definitely, again, with McDavid, a lot getting put on his plate, how he's being kind of poopy pants all around. This has kind of been McDavid all throughout. Like, even in juniors playing with Erie, he's had a temper. He never really showed... Uh, a lot of personality or love for media attention and stuff like that. I don't blame him. Like, I wouldn't love it in my face all the time either. But the argument is, like, you are a professional. This is part of your job. So, you know, put on a happy face and and say what the people want to hear at times. And, yes, it definitely does project on the ice as well. He definitely, when they're not winning or sometimes even when they are winning, like the the thing they were talking about on on Steve Dangle this week was Connor McDavid. They win a game, the first game with Knobloch on the bench. McDavid gets out of his slump, goal and an assist. Crowd's feeling it and he's having an interview and it looks like he could not care fucking less about winning that game. Uh, scoring a couple points, getting out of the slump, winning for the new coach. But maybe he's thinking about other things. Maybe he's thinking, maybe he needs to simplify his thinking and maybe he's thinking too far in the future to think worrying too much about playoffs or something. And maybe they need to simplify reverse and just think game to game. Okay, tonight we got the Kraken. Tomorrow we got, don't worry about tomorrow. Just focus on the Kraken tonight and get it done. Maybe McDavid is thinking about, yeah, great. We got one win. We are still in the bottom of the league. There's still a lot of work to be done. Could he have said that? Maybe. But again, I don't watch that stuff. That's just, I've never, ever liked the after game interview stuff. It's just never been appealing to me. It's mostly copy and paste answers. And, you know, reporters honestly kind of prying and poking at people, especially after losses, you know, taking advantage of competitors, very, very competitive athletes after a loss. Who likes losing? I don't, and I'm not even an athlete. I just don't like losing, period. And you're they're kind of poking, poking and prodding at these players, trying to get a quote, trying to get something. Like It's part of their job, but honestly, like, it's a little gross at times, honestly. Especially, I don't remember the guy's name in Edmonton, but he definitely, especially with Leon and McDavid, like the... Like, I get it. You're a reporter. It would be nice to have easy superstars to work with. Like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a Connor Bedard to work with? Like, oh, he seems nice and easy going. Austin Matthews, cool and calm and collected. And then you got McDavid, who's kind of, you know, grumpy and, and not a great quote and not necessarily personable or marketable, honestly. And then Leon's just snapping back at you. He doesn't like, you know, if you're going to snap at him, he'll snap back. He's not scared. And I like that about him a, a lot, honestly. But yeah, a lot of heat on McDavid around the way that this team is going and we've seen it before we saw kind of the crumbling of the Chicago Blackhawks at the end of their dynasty with Kane and Taves where they started having a little too much influence around the team like hey let's I'm not saying they necessarily said trade Panarin for Saad but they wanted to bring the boys back together and it kind of ruined their team they over adjusted getting wrecked in the playoffs and yeah they haven't bounced back since so 
We'll see what the Oilers, so far they're trending upwards. I'm curious to uh, hear what y'all think about what is going to happen with the Oilers. I mean, it's... They're, they definitely dug themselves into a hole. It is, it is. A, they have an opportunity to get out of it. The, the vision they're in isn't, you know, it's not done yet. Teams haven't, uh, you know, other than the Canucks who are on fire right now. We'll talk about them, but there's an opportunity for the Oilers. They got to get on a big winning streak. A lot of people feel encouraged that they can do that. They can go uh, eight out of ten, win eight games, and yeah, they can do that a couple of times and. Boom, back into business. They got the best players on the team, new coach, new motivation. So looks good. Curious to hear what y'all think about the new coaching change. Are you are you are you team Woodcroft? Do you think he's gonna bounce back? Do you think he was overrated? Do you think it's just oh he's he was given the reins with McDavid and Dryside? A lot of people are going to do fine in that in that spot, but I don't know, man. They've gone through quite a few coaches, so it's going to be interesting, man, for the for the Oilers going forward, but they're trending upward, so it's interesting. Speaking of trending upward, man, let's talk about these Vancouver Canucks. I mean, I'm blown away. Blown away with this freaking team. Quinn Hughes, ladies and gentlemen, wow. This guy would probably, if the season ended today, he's probably winning the Norris. He has been out of control good for the Vancouver Canucks this season. And it's honestly really nice to see things actually working out for the Canucks. The heronic thing, a lot of people were giving that trade shit, and the dude has been Unbelievable. Unfreaking believable. Yeah, he finally, he only got one goal. He finally got his first goal the other night. Awesome, but a dish king, man. Every single game, putting up an assist, pairing super nicely <clears throat> with Quinn Hughes. It's been great. And Pedersen looks like an Omega star. He looks like he's going to be, uh, he's going to get a lot of money, man. And he looks unbelievable. And he's winning over the crowd a lot right now. Like, uh, he had a great game. I think he put up like two or three points, something like that. And he went to the coach and said, like, I apologize for that performance. Like there was some things about that game that I didn't like and apologizing when you had so many points and you know, on, on the stat sheet, a fantastic game and, and doing that. What a leader you love. You love it. You have a, a guy that's leading the league right now in points. And, you know, you want to run through a wall. That's like that. Like, geez, he's putting up all those points and he, he's, you know, still, thinks he get, he wants more out of himself so that's uh, extremely respectable Quinn Hughes the quiet just humming along the captain of these these Canucks Rick Tockett has got this team humming right now Thatcher Demko so that's the great thing that's going on with the Canucks right now man they've got they got a superstar performing at a superstar level in all three positions they got Pedersen and Miller honestly on forward doing phenomenal you got Heronic and Quinn Hughes on the back end and you got Thatcher Demko healthy and just humming along doing great you got oh what's the backup goalie DeSmith is doing really good as the backup for them and yes, so there's some things about the Canucks that may be a little bit of a red flag. So they are going on a PTO bender. What does that mean? While their shooting percentage is off the charts, they're shooting the lights out. A lot of things are going their way, bounces, and that happens. That's what is, that's the appeal at times about the NHL. It's random, it's weird, it's it's wacky things can just happen like the Oilers can go and be down there with the Sharks and Vancouver's winning like not a lot of people saw that coming and boom there it is so things are going the Canucks way even if they come down from their PTO or PTO PTO PDO uh, bender that they're going on if their shooting percentage comes down if this and that comes down uh, with this hot start, if they play 500 hockey, they could and should make it into the playoffs. So this is why people stress a hot start, a good start to the season is very important. It could get you in the playoffs, especially if other teams stumble out of the gate. As long as you don't do it like what Philadelphia did, where they went on a big winning streak. Actually, no, sorry, Buffalo did this. Go on a big winning streak, and then you went on an even bigger losing streak. So as long as that doesn't happen for the Canucks, I mean, they are down Susie for six to eight weeks. That could be an underratedly pretty big hit to the Canucks blue line. I mean, he's uh, brought in this offseason. You know, some eyebrows were raised, but they knew what they needed on the back end. They needed some size. They needed some some grit. They needed some toughness. And Susie was providing that for them quite 
nicely, honestly. And now that is gone for six to eight weeks. Will they be able to fill in that role? They could. They absolutely could. We'll see what happens with that. But that's a big hit, man. Six to eight weeks, nothing nothing to fuck around. That's that's two to three months. So big deal right there. But the Canucks, man, I, I am very impressed. I think the only other thing uh, with the Canucks, I think it's their penalty kill that isn't doing great. And their power play is doing really, really great. But what? We saw Edmonton finish the season at like 45 plus percent power play and the Canucks are at like 30 something percent so why why wouldn't they be able to keep it at that as long as Hughes and the superstars and everyone stays healthy why not and also just a little shout out extra to JT Miller who has really really turned his game around I don't hear anyone talking shit about his defensive game he's honestly kind of turned himself into a a new age Ryan Kessler where he is uh, kind of a fucking asshole to play against he's emotional and a battler and he'll drag the team into it and yeah man I mean kind of got to like that it's uh, maybe people are going to look back on the Horvat or Miller you know, their decision who to keep. And they ended up keeping Miller, moved off on Horvat. Horvat isn't doing bad in the island, but not doing as good as he would in Vancouver. And Canucks looking pretty smart like right now. I mean, the Islanders are on a huge losing streak. We'll talk about it in a moment, but Canucks doing well, man. Do you guys think that the Canucks can keep this going and, and get into the playoffs? I really hope so. The Canucks fans... Uh, though at times they can be extremely annoying, I must say, and I don't, I, I, I really, uh, I don't know if I can ever really forgive the riots in, in 2011. That just really, really, uh, but anyway, it's, we won't talk about the bad times. It's good times right now in Vancouver. So fuck yeah. Keep it up, Vancouver. Keep up those good times. Speaking of good times, what can we do with the good times? Ladies and gentlemen, the San Jose Sharks. We're on a winning streak of two games. Oh, oh, get the parade ready. The San Jose Sharks are going to go on a run. No, I'm just kidding. They're still awful. They're terrible. But they finally won. And it wasn't Edmonton first. So, you know, the Oilers got that. Philadelphia are the first to fall to San Jose this season. And yeah, I mean, it's been... I don't know when the last time we talked about Philly. It might have been a few weeks, but... When I was talking about the Flyers, I was like, hey, man, they're doing pretty all right. Kind of hot. Pretty all right. Konechny, he's still doing really good, actually. But, yeah, they definitely have fallen off since their pretty damn good start to the season. And, honestly, that was kind of expected with a Tortorella team. Tortorella wasn't going to fuck around. He was going to have that team ready to go, ready with the systems and, you know, blocking shots, doing the doing Tortorella thing out of the gate. So it was definitely going to catch some teams that maybe, eh, you know, we had a long summer having some fun. What's up, boys? How we doing? Not a Tortorella team. So maybe caught some teams off guard at the early point. But yeah, they've fallen off. Losing to San Jose definitely stings. You don't, you don't like that. You don't want to be the first team to fall. But uh, it maybe eases the pain that, you know, Edmonton lost to them right after that. So, hey, San Jose, <laughs> they got some wins right there. There's really not still anything much more uh good to say about the san jose sharks yeah they're they're just plucking around along around there but hey they got a win will they be able to get out of the worst team of all time territory so hold on what is their current record right now with the san jose sharks well, they're they're still just dreadful at a two thirteen and one, and yeah, they they answered back after the two wins with some pretty vicious losses on the board right there. You got they got absolutely handled by Vegas five nothing. Anaheim dealt with them four one, and Florida dealt with them five to three. So uh, the winning streak ended abruptly, very very fast. And yeah, so there's that. So uh, you know, congratulations. At least they got the two wins. Uh, what five more wins? and I think they tie themselves with the the 70s Capitals. So can they get five wins over and at the end of November? What do you think? I doubt it. <laughs> I really, really doubt it. So yeah, not going well with the San Jose Sharks. And you know who else is on losing streaks right now? The Islanders. The New York Islanders are really, really struggling right now. And this might be my fault. Now, I drafted Ilya Sorokin this season. I put my chips in on him, drafted him very early. I wanted to go in this particular fantasy league. Goaltending is very important. And I wanted to put 
my money down on someone who's very consistent, a little bit risky. I knew the risk with the Islanders. It's like, okay, uh, they probably won't score, but they're, they tend to be very good at keeping the puck out of the net. And I'm not going to put it all on Sorokin, but he has not been, you know, Ilya Sorokin so far this season, not putting up the numbers. And the Islanders are finding their way to lose games, man. There have been, I've, Put on a couple of Islanders games. Just, you know, watch Sorokin play. I do have a few Islanders on some teams right now. So I've been kind of eyeing up the Islanders, see what's going on. I'm not a huge fan of them or anything, but uh, I, I, I I do like Sorokin. So I've seen some games, and man, like, out of nowhere, what? They've blown a couple of three-goal leads, I believe, which is very, very not Sorokin-like. Maybe you can count them on your one hand how many times that has happened in Sorokin's career so far. And yeah, man, it's uh, not looking good for the Islanders. I think they're on a six-game losing streak now after the loss the other night. And uh, another late loss. What was Edmonton scoring the late hat trick on them, I think it was. So yeah, not uh, not ideal for the Islanders. It kind of looked like they were they could squeak into a wild card spot. But now the Penguins are kind of surging. The Capitals are sort of surging. And yeah, Islanders trending downward in a really, really bad, fast way. So they continue this losing streak added in like three more they're gonna fucking get themselves in a really nasty hole to get out of and not good I mean I don't I don't know how many more uh times Sorokin can steal games and how many more seasons Sorokin can uh hold up uh maybe a mediocre Islanders team I mean there's not really anyone doing anything crazy with the Islanders right now I mean Brock Nelson I got him on my team he's like not not off to the greatest start, you know, a handful, a couple good games there. He had a, a game there where he had 10 shots, but nothing to show for it. So, like, he's trying, but, yeah, man, I mean, I've, I've never been a big fan. Like, they're old. They're kind of slow. Uh, I think it might be time to change things up. You still got Lou Lamorello running that team. Is it, are we almost done with that? Is that man ever going to not be there? Will he be 155 years old? And we're still going to be talking about Lou signing random third, fourth line guy to seven year deal. I don't know. And not going good for the Islanders. And also the Columbus Blue Jackets not doing good right now either. Also on a six game losing streak. So talked about Goudreau getting benched. Not doing great over there. Speculate, not really, not real speculation around Calgary swapping Goudreau for Huberdo. You know, maybe that would help out. Yeah, I don't know about that necessarily. I would love, I would love Johnny Goudreau, Johnny Hockey to return to Calgary. I would welcome him with open arms. Don't think it's going to happen though. Patrick Line returning to the lineup. Uh, that will definitely help, but I mean, Line A coming off of lots of injuries, inconsistencies throughout his career. Uh, Marchenko has been doing pretty good, I must say. What, tripling, quadrupling the assist amount that he had last season? Maybe not putting up as many goals, but that was very much so expected. Uh, Marchenko's been solid goaltending. I mean, a slight bounce back for Merz Lickens, but. Again, does not look like it's going to be a very successful year for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, better than last year. I mean, Fantilli getting some goals out there. Was there a hat trick for Fantilli? There might have been. And uh, some of the... Uh, uh, Ken Johnson, I think, was sent down. We talked about that last week. Sillinger still kind of trying to find his way. Yeah, man, it doesn't look like it's going to be another successful uh, year for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, maybe some, you know, questions on Johnny Goudreau. Was that the right signing at the right time? I don't know about that one. It, there's still a lot of time on that contract, but, you know, the way that it's gone so far with Goudreau, I mean, even if the team starts to build up with some of the, the prospects that they built in, you know, they, they had some pretty interesting picks in the draft with Boot and uh, another defenseman. Uh, their decor has been better. You know, Provorov has been pretty good. I know. It's just, you know, the team is still on the rise. They're still not necessarily in a rebuild, but they're still weird, man. They're still playing around in that area that's not good in that kind of funky middle. So Columbus struggling, not doing great, and, yeah, not doing good for Columbus. Maybe we'll switch over to something that is as decent to talk about. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about something good. Let's talk about some players that are heating up, so... Connor Bedard, 
Uh, uh, conversation around him cooling down a little bit and now it's heating back up because the kid is heating up ladies and gentlemen oh my goodness so putting up a bunch of goals right right now had a huge game against the Tampa Bay Lightning and then folded up with another two goal performance so yeah man really impressive what Connor Bedard is doing right now with a not great team around him admittedly I mean when your your top line mates are like Tyler Johnson, Corey Perry, and shit like that. No shade to them. I mean, they know their role. They know what it is. But Connor Bedard, man, is really starting to... Uh, already turned heads, but the heads are turning back around again for Connor Bedard. Really, really impressive. Some of those goals, man. Uh, really high IQ, like bouncing the puck um, off of the goaltender. I believe the one really nice goal... Uh, against Bobrovsky, I think it was. Some really impressive. And, of course, that release. Oh, my goodness. Connor Bedard's release is terrifying. Would not want to be a goaltender in the league right now. I would love to be a goaltender, like, maybe in the age range of a, of a Cam, Cam Talbot, where you're like, all right, I got a couple more years. Let's see how these young kids do. And then I could just kind of shy away. Because, oh, my God, that shot is terrifying. Connor Bedard Wow, dude, that kid has been lighting it up lately. Will he be able to keep it up? The way with rookies, they, you know, they tend to go through a lot of streaks. You know, Con Connor Bedard was a little quiet there for a little bit, and now he's heating back up. Uh, you know, the way that it's gone, I wouldn't be surprised for him to go quiet, maybe pointless for three, four games, and then explode for another three points or something like that. Maybe six points in three games. Do that kind of thing. But maybe this is the beginning of... Connor Bedard already showing us that he's a generational talent and continues to put up a consistent amount of points. That would be great for everybody in the NHL. Speaking of great, New York Rangers are excellent so far this season. They look like they're reg they're legit. They're not fugazis. They're for realsies, apparently. So that's, that's what's going on. Uh, even without uh, Shesterkin, they've been winning games. Panarin is... Uh, doing the reverse Samson or whatever, where you, you, you cut off your hair and you gain all your powers back. The dude is on fire, white hot. And guess who else is starting to heat up, everybody? Lafreniere. Oh, baby. So in the last, what, how many games here? Uh, three goals, four assists in the last seven games. Pretty damn good, man. Now, it's not insane, but considering you know how Lafreniere has... You know, shown flashes here and there. This is one of his better ones. And this could be the start of Lafreniere really starting to emerge and show off that this... I'm the first over... I was the first overall pick in 2020 and I'm arriving. You know, it took Jack Hughes a minute. He's arrived. He shared. Took him a minute. He's arrived. And maybe it's time for Lafreniere. It, I like to you know, talk about that three year and it's been over three years. So, you know, it is time. It is time. This is the time for Lafreniere. Hopefully he can keep that up. I would love that. I, I don't like seeing uh, players not be successful. Like I didn't like seeing Yakupov disappear. That first season with Yakupov, his rookie season was a lot of fun. It really was. It was a nice, fun, solid rookie season for him. And it looked like sky's the limit this kid could be ridiculous and then he was just gone and it's just like oh that kind of that that stinks I don't like that and you know there's the other side of of that with the Rangers with Capo Caco who hasn't necessarily got going yet and, and it stinks and and Hedl has been injured so you know that that kid line hasn't been fully in effect but at least Lafreniere is going and some people questioning you know if Caco doesn't get it Going this season, there's a really good chance that they could move on from Kako, especially if there is a need at the trade deadline area. Could they move on from Kako this season? Uh, maybe not likely because he's still responsible defensively for his age. It's, he's not a useless player. He's not a net negative to the Rangers. But uh, yeah, it's definitely been a little bit disappointing. And there's been more time with Kako in the oven. If I'm not mistaken, was Kako not selected the, the the year before Lafreniere, I may be mixing that up. Might have been the year after, but regardless, a second overall pick, you would be expecting a little bit more out of them by this time frame. So we'll keep an eye on Kako, but at least Lafreniere is doing really good. That's a lot of fun. So hopefully, I want that to keep up. And then Winnipeg, man, got to talk about Winnipeg. I'm 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 disappointed in myself. I don't talk about the Jets enough, man. And Cole Perfetti, oh, whoa, this kid is 
What's up? What's up? Oh my god, Cole Perfetti has arrived, everybody, with the Winnipeg Jets. And this is great. Really like Cole, Cole Perfetti uh, in the video games. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, I haven't played NHL video games in a few years, but there was a lot of, um, a few games there where Cole Perfetti was like my boy. I can get him fairly cheap from the Winnipeg Jets. And he would always become a really solid, good top line center. And bro, this guy is on a point streak right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven game point streak, putting up two, four, six, eight nine points during that point streak so and you know might be some sheltered minutes here like the the time on ice isn't eye popping the highest in that point streak is 16 minutes and 12 so yeah 16 minutes 12 seconds low end you're looking at 13 26 so you're not looking at top line minutes you're looking at like kind of almost maybe third line with some power play or second line oh that seems a little low for second line but but regardless, uh, Perfetti is putting up points, and that's fucking excellent for the Winnipeg Jets. And they've been rolling along pretty decently, man, lately. Like, a little bit up and down, but they're trending pretty good. They've won four out of their last five games. Hellebuck, you know, off to a shaky start. Not really a Hellebuck start, but playing better. Definitely playing better. And the Jets are rolling, man. Uh, Connor, fucking goddamn Kyle Connor, man. One of my favorite players in the league. Doing his thing, baby. Getting goals. Just a silent assassin over there in Winnipeg. And I really like it. Jets are rolling, man. They're well on their way into a playoff spot right now. They keep that up. Uh, looking really good. And I'm really hoping Cole Perfetti can keep that up. Just pick them up in fantasy. If you haven't uh, picked up Cole Perfetti, if he's still available in your fantasy leagues, check him out, man. Like, I know he's a he's a straight-up center. There might be a lot of people out there struggling with the center position. But keep your eyes on Cole Perfetti. This could be the emerging season for him which is wicked speaking of wicked <sighs> number 68 ladies and gentlemen Yarmir Yager still playing the game not playing it currently but should be and looks to be still playing in the fuck I don't know where the hell he is right now in Europe playing but he's still playing professional hockey he owns a hockey team he plays for that hockey team that he owns and that's fucking awesome and on top of that he is Finally, getting his number retired, number 68 by the Pittsburgh Penguins. Fuck yeah. And I wish they can also, like, raise a mullet up to the top of the rafters as well. That would just be meh. But fuck yeah. And that has also sparked the conversation around the Hall of Fame. That's been going on this week as well. We discussed the Hall of Fame and the, and the entrance and all that. But uh, Hendrik Lundqvist strapping up the skates again, not allowing any goals. That was, of course, the king not going to let in any goals. But people talking about, you know, when the fuck is Yager going to get into the Hall of Fame? But there are rules around the Hall of Fame. So you're you're supposed to be retired for three years, and then you are eligible to enter the Hall of Fame. The last time they waived that was for Wayne Gretzky, you know, kind of the greatest player in NHL history and all that kind of stuff. You know, you might have heard of him. So that was the last time that was waived in 1999 when Wayne retired. And people are talking about, oh, well, they should just put Yager in. And they're like, well, he's still technically playing. Yeah, he hasn't played in the NHL in a long time, but he's still playing. So, like, there's a debate. Now, honestly, I would be, I wouldn't fucking think twice if he got put into the Hall of Fame right now. Absolutely. He's a bona fide first ballot Hall of Famer. It's just there's rules and you know I'm I don't give a fuck about rules for the most part. You know, rules are meant to be bent and shit like that. I think Yager is deserving of it. One of the greatest players of all time, one of the most legendary iconic players of all time. The mullet, the salute, like come the fuck on NHL. Even though it's not technically the NHL the Hall of Fame is a completely different entity and all that shit but my boy Lanny McDonald is on there and Lanny go on get the armor in there let's do this shit well at least he's getting his number retired and that's awesome so good for Yarmir Yager and I I guess speaking of good things we have some sort of good things to talk about with the Calgary Flames so the young kids are getting called up, and this is great. This is great news. Wolf got called up, played a game, didn't win the game, but did not look bad at all. That is great. Wolf looks to be 
what could be the future of the Calgary Flames goaltending. Some people speculating that they could move Markstrom, they could move Vladar, one of them. Some people uh, more favored towards Vladar because Markstrom's been playing pretty good. He's a veteran. Maybe he could shepherd along Wolf a little bit better than Vladar, who hasn't really made a steady, consistent impact in the league yet. So they could move on from, from Vladar. There is a little bit of a cap hit behind that and maybe not a lot of trade value because he hasn't really done all that great in Calgary, all said and done. So I don't know. But regardless, it's good to see Wolf is up there getting in some NHL games. That is awesome. And he's not the only one coming up and, and making an impact for the Flames right now. Zari has been excellent, called up, putting up a point every single game pretty much. I mean, fuck yeah. It is definitely added some new flame to the Calgary Flames with these young kids coming in. Pospisil came in as well and also putting up some freaking points. This is awesome. This is the start. This is what I would have loved to seen out of the gate from the Flames. Like if fucking... Oh man, what's the guy that got injured? If if he didn't get injured and you had freaking Zari in there and you had Pospisil and you had Coronado and maybe got off to a good start with all these young kids, new energy, new coach, new GM... That was what was expected and hoped for out of the Flames. And it's coming now, but is it too late? So, Zadorov has come out requesting a trade. Uh, the, the, his agent during the Toronto Maple Leafs game saying, you know, I'll get your tickets for Leafs forever, some horse shit. So, you know, adding fuel to the flame of Zadorov connected to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Will Zadorov get traded to the Leafs? Um, maybe. There's definitely interest there. The, the Leafs have been knocking on the door of that one. Not alone, though. You know, Vancouver's in there as well. Uh, apparently, uh, Detroit has also been kicking tires as well. So it's not the Leafs and only the Leafs. And I will admit, I am I am very antsy. I'm checking my phone all the time to see if this has gone down. But from what I'm hearing, this isn't something that's going to happen like today tomorrow this week or maybe not even for a few weeks it seems like Calgary may take their time with this kind of gauge the offers and see what the best thing they can get especially if there's interest you're definitely going to want to drive up the price and um his, uh, Zadorov's agent coming out and saying oh you know the best defensemen aren't getting the ice time so hey they throw a couple extra minutes towards Zadorov he puts up a couple extra points really get fluffed up uh, that'd be great for the Flames, not so great for the Leafs. They might have to pay a little bit more. And the price, admittedly, is not... Oh, it's a lot. It's it's a lot. So, theoretically, Leafs would maybe be giving up something like a Fraser Minton, uh, maybe throwing in a Klingberg or TJ Brody, because the money's got to work out somehow. The money is going to be a big issue, so there's got to be money in, money out. Calgary can retain... On the deals, that should not be a problem for them retaining 50% on everyone. They're all on one-year deals. It's not a big deal for the Flames to do that. But that's going to drive up the price again for whichever team is going after these guys. So giving up a Fraser Mitten, you know, a 19-year-old that cracked the lineup, maybe at a necessity, uh, but did look good in preseason, didn't stay in the lineup, did get sent down, lost that spot, but very encouraging and... Uh, yeah, there might be a draft pick involved in as well, but Zadorov might not be the only piece out of Calgary that the Leafs are looking at. Tanev as well, uh, drawing some interest. Um, Treliving, obviously the former GM of Calgary, has, has knows these guys well, knows his boys, and would love to have his boys back. It's a hefty price tag, though. Like, not only will he have to give up a, a nice piece to get both or one of them, I think, uh, probably... Less if you bring in Tanev, he's older, uh, definitely had some injury history as of late, so you might be able to get him for a decent price. Zadorov, 28 years old, nice, big, strong defenseman, putting up some good seasons with Calgary, and you know, we've heard uh, on the ice during that Flames Leaf game that someone on the Leaf said to Zadorov, Hey, man. You're exactly what we need on this team. And they're not wrong. I think that's exactly what they need. Uh, Muzzin, ever since Muzzin has gone down, they have been looking to replace Muzzin. And they haven't been able to do that successfully. And I think Sidorov is the closest thing that they're going to get that is available out there right now to Jake Muzzin. If if we can heal Jake Muzzin, put him in a, a, a chamber of sorts, and heal him up, that would be perfect. I would love Jake Muzzin is exactly 
exactly what the blue knight in Toronto needs. But Zadorov would be great. And Tanov on top, oh my goodness, I would cream. Like, would you do a would you flop TJ Brody, John Klingberg, Frazier Mitten in a pick and maybe another prospect for Tanov and Zadorov? Like pretending the money works, maybe Lilligren gets thrown in there as well. Would we do that? I mean, fuck me sideways. I just might fucking be all right with that because uh, you probably let Tanev walk. You might be able to re-sign Zadorov for a respectable price. Depends how it goes. If you keep him happy, give him the ice time that he allegedly wants. And uh, yeah, it could work out, but we'll... We'll see, man. It's I'm disappointed that it doesn't sound like it's going to be something that happens very, very soon. I would love for it to happen sooner rather than later with the Leafs. We know what they need. They need a big fucking defenseman. They need it, and uh, that's what they need. And I don't think they should if they can get get it done as fast as possible. But I understand the Flames should understandably take their time with this that's that's the right thing to do don't rush into trades don't just be like oh here you go just take it because i love you brad for i i hope there's you know a brad tax you know oh all right brad i'll throw you a bone uh yeah just give us a set a seventh rounder and uh this this guy i don't know we'll take on klingberg for you here take 10 of 50 percent retain here you go and mwah, there you go thank you so much but that's not gonna happen it's the nhl right so uh speculations we'll keep our eye on what is going on with zadorov and what's going on with the flames and who they may be trading and you know lindholm again i will be so upset so upset if they re-sign lindholm and and don't trade him because fuck he's been awful he's been so bad he's got like zero i think two assists over the last eight or nine games something like that and those two assists came in one game he's been invisible invisible in home come on you have to start getting some points for the sake of the flames get it going get it going because they gotta fluff you up they gotta deal you out of here and they're not going to be able to trade you and get anything awesome if you're putting up goose eggs every single game so get some freaking points out there for goodness sakes because you're going to lose your spot to people like Zari or something like that. Because he's been fantastic. Pospisil. Uh, maybe they bring back up Coronado now that the young guys are starting to heat up. So we'll see, we'll see what's going on with the Flames. But that's been interesting. Swinging over to Toronto now. Uh, so they're going to Sweden. They play in Sweden tomorrow. Don't forget, everybody. They have a game at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Canadian time, anyway. Uh, we'll not be watching the one on Sunday because that's going on like 8 in the morning. I work nights, so I'll be night-night time for that. I uh, won't be watching it, but I'll watch the highlights, see what's going on. Uh, the... I think Detroit and Ottawa are playing right now in in Sweden. Uh, I don't have eyes on it right now, but I'll go check it out. I'll go see what it looks like. It's exciting. Like, it's cool that they're going over there. But again, you know, NHL doesn't market it very well. I I haven't seen anything really about it, honestly. So, you know, the usual stuff where the NHL tries but uh, don't really try hard enough, I don't think. But they're over there. The Leafs are going there. It'll be interesting. Like, at least they, they got that big old win over Vancouver. That was great. Nylander's point streak is is gone out of control. This dude, he might be the best Leaf on the team right now, even over Austin Matthews. Like, it, it I don't, he's been so fucking good. Like, where was this Nylander, like, all the time? Like, that's always been the thing with Nylander is like, oh, he, you know, he's, he takes over games for, like, a week straight, and then he goes invisible for a few days. You're like, where, what is that? Like, stop. And this year, he, he stopped it. He stopped it. And he's just been dominant. But, uh, no, Klingberg, just downright bad been playing so bad. Uh, Reeves getting benched and, uh, scratched and, um, very interesting was that game where he did get uh, scratch. He got Bobby McMahon going in, playing really good. I believe had a couple apples in his debut. And the really interesting thing, which I'm, I'm, you know, there wasn't as much conversation around it, but with Revo getting scratched, we had two fights in that game. Giordano getting involved, my fucking hero. I love that man. Love that man so much. And Max Domi, both getting into scraps in the Vancouver Canucks games, but they didn't fight right. So, you know, the, you have to give your opponent an opportunity to get into the fight as well, or you're going to take an instigator. So Domi and Gio both took an instigator and Vancouver cashes in on both of those power plays. So people are like, 
you know, it's it, you can't ever have our cake and eat it too, can we? In Toronto, it's like, yay, we get the fighting that we wanted, but oh no, they scored on both the power plays. So that definitely, definitely would have been a bigger story if the Leafs lost that game. Thankfully, they won, so it wasn't a big deal. So it was good. All said and done. Like, it's good. Giordano stood up for his boy. Max Domi stood up for his boy. Arguably, they're on clean hits and shit. But it's good that they stood up. Like, I never want to see that again where, you know, Lilligren getting hurt. No one's around him. No one even recognizes what is going on. And no standing up, nothing. So it's very good to see that from Domi, who has been lighting it up lately. Playing center, finally, with uh, someone that can finish the puck. So that's been great. Nick Robertson has been heating it up along with... Tommy so that's awesome so good to see Robertson starting to you know get there starting to put up points in the NHL because he deserves it he's been trying so hard but been so very very unlucky so the Vancouver game very good that they won that one because you didn't want uh to go on the long flight over to Sweden with that stink in your mouth you beat Arguably the best Canadian team in the league. They they are, technically, uh, right now in Canada. So you beat them. That's that's excellent. Uh, not so good against Ottawa. Uh, they fell apart quickly. What, three goals in three minutes for the Sens in the third period? The fuck? So that wasn't good. Um, yeah. And that, that game against Calgary was, like I kind of predicted, a little bit of a fucking tire fire. Defensively, both teams were pretty bad. It was a fun game. It was a 5-4 to shootout win. And they had the big hit with Zadorov on Bertuzzi. That was a lot of fun. That was a fun game. But there was a couple of times that I had, like, my head over my eyes, like, watching the defense. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's so bad all around. But a uh, pretty fun game anyway. So Leafs going into Sweden on a high note. So that's good. We'll see how they do in Sweden. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, with the Leafs, when there's, a, when there's an excuse to be made, they tend to take it and lose the game. So they'll be like, oh, we're tired from the flight and yada, yada, playing a game in the morning. Ah. But they play good in the afternoons, like... They always they, they tend to play good at those 2 p.m. games, so maybe they light it up. Uh, who are they playing first? I believe it's Detroit first, and then they're going to be playing Minnesota on Sunday. Yeah, so Red Wings tomorrow at 2 p.m. and the Wild at 8 a.m. Uh, wild, what a wild time. I, I don't know if we'll ever see that one again, but going to be interesting to see how the Leafs do overseas and more interestingly will be how they do when they return with the jet lag and all that I do believe they're going to give them a pretty all right break we'll take uh we'll take a look there and just make sure uh the, I hate the scheduling that they have right now on the NHL so yeah they're gonna have like five days off until they play Chicago so that's decent so that that'll be fair that's a good amount of time to get their shit back together from the flight so that's nice Speaking of nice, how about the St. Louis Blues? And more importantly, Jordan Bennington. What is going on? So this is where I kind of have the goalie voodoo thing pulling me at both ends. So I drafted Sorokin. He ain't doing good. But I also drafted Jordan Bennington. And he's doing fantastic. Fantastic. He shut out, what, Colorado or something? 5 nothing. What a performance. He's been great all year long, honestly. And the backup goaltender, Hofer, has also been quite solid. Uh, the story the, is not uh, goaltending. It was not the problem this season in St. Louis. And that was the big question mark. Uh, the biggest one I would say going into their season was, Hey, is goaltending going to be all right? Like what the fuck? There's been some Jordan Bennington to Edmonton rumors going around. What? What? That would be the most Ken Holland deal. Like that's the kind of shit that makes me scared about Ken Holland still being there. It's like, if he makes that deal, Oh my god, like, ooh, 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 ooh. but St. Louis has been doing all right, man, they've been winning some games right now, uh, maybe catching some teams by surprise, uh, to- Riley, to- Riley Thomas, I don't, I don't know, he's been heating up though, man, like, he's been putting up points, Kairou still not quite out of that funk yet, but not bad, man, St. Louis, like I said, I, I do believe I had them in the playoffs making it, and I thought, you know, with some of, some of the moves, maybe some things can go right, if the, and the defense has been kind of turning it up a little bit, Tori Krug starting to put up a little bit of points they're on a nice three game winning streak oh okay so they shut out tampa bay five nothing and they mutilated colorado eight to two colorado has been a really weird team uh getting shut out consistently like what three four times now uh putting up getting 
eight spotted by St. Louis and kind of getting dominated by the Blues in that game. Like it, it was not a very uh, good looking game for the Colorado Avalanche, but a fantastic game for St. Louis and the Rollins. So I kind of would hope uh, St. Louis can keep this going because I, I would like for them to bounce back. They're not a bad team. There's a lot of guys there that kind of like, you know, Braden Shen's there doing his thing. Uh, yeah, you know, Blues, doing it. They're doing their things. Who else is doing their thing out there right now? Patrick Kane's uh, agent has been kind of doing his thing out there. Well, more, more so the Florida GM, uh, Del Belzito, something like that. Apparently very aggressively chasing after Patrick Kane right now and wicked. Honestly, I want him to go to Buffalo. That's where I want him to go more than anything. But Florida makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a place that a lot of older stars like to go finish out their career in the sun. Don't blame them. Great spot to go. Uh, you could sign cheap, but a lot of people asking, like, well, how much can Patrick Kane really offer up? And honestly, I don't think he's asking for a lot. More than likely going to sign a league minimum, maybe a million dollars, but sh- more than likely going to be laden with some bonuses. Very easy to hit performance bonuses. Like, oh, skate for eight seconds. Here's a million dollars. Uh, look left and right. Here's a million dollars. Shit like that. So, Patrick Kane, uh, the, it's starting to heat up a little bit more around the conversation with him and Florida. Apparently very, very interested. So we'll see if Patrick Kane gets signed anytime soon. Why not try him out on a PTO or something? Just get him skating with the team. Is that is that not okay? I don't know. So, so speaking of not okay, we got some injuries here going on in the NHL. Uh, we'll start out with Nashville with one of the more underrated players, I think, in the league. And Novak will be out four to six weeks, which which stinks for, for Nashville. I mean, younger player that's been putting up some decent points over the last year and a half or so. That's definitely not going to be good for Nashville. They've been kind of spinning tires. UC Soros hasn't quite been UC Soros. There's been... Uh, you know, people talking about the idea of will UC Soros get traded somewhere and Edmonton Oilers fans playing saying, oh, please, God, yes, trade him to us, please. But uh, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, I don't want UC Soros, like, He's such a good goaltender. Same with Sorokin. Like, if, if the Islanders start going downhill, I wouldn't want Sorokin to go down with that ship either. I would like him to go somewhere and be successful and maybe be the final piece for someone to take them to the Stanley Cup final. But Sorokin, with the big contract coming in, uh, Soros could, again, like, if he gets sent over to Edmonton, they could maybe fuck around and win a cup with a guy like that. But, yeah, Novak going down uh, for quite a bit. That stinks. And who else was going down? Uh, Colorado, Franzos, man. Like, is that, the poor guy is never healthy. When he's in there, he's usually pretty damn good. But sadly, he is going to be out for the rest of the season. So that stinks, man. That really stinks. Uh, this early in the season to get news like that, that sucks. And it may be the end of Franzos. He's just been so many, so many freaking injuries with this guy. Like, it it really stinks. Colorado fans probably not into that. I think they have that young goaltender with a P or something. But yeah, it's definitely a lot more has been put on Gorgiev's plate, who, um, is playing okay, but, you know, not necessarily stealing everything. Colorado hasn't quite been themselves this season, but you know, there's been a lot of turnover since the Cub. Landis Gog's not there. That's definitely been a, a thing for them, like not having your captain. And, you know, uh, McKinnon was a little bit uh, off out of the gate, but looks like McKinnon again. But, yeah, they're backup goaltenders, so maybe Colorado is going to be out there looking for some sort of goaltending help. We'll keep an eye on that one. More Buffalo Sabres news. I do believe that uh, Thompson is down. Uh, Speculation that it may be like really, really bad. A month to month potentially. But it has been brought down to a week to week injury. Regardless, that's their best, most dominating offensive forward. So the Sabres are going to have to battle through that. But there is a little bit of good news with the Sabres. At least Kyle Lacpozo, the captain, has hit 1,000 games. Congratulations to Kyle Lacpozo. I mean... Uh, it, it didn't start out great with the Buffalo Sabres. That contract, when he signed it, a lot of people were like, goo, but it has, a, has come out to be a really solid addition for the Sabres. Maybe not always putting up the points that people wanted for the amount of money, but becoming the captain, a leader in the locker room, and just a really loved guy in, in Buffalo. So congratulations to Kyle Pozo. 
I guess a minor congratulations in order for Shane Wright. He got called up for the with the Kraken. I don't know if he did anything. I guess I should probably, you know, I should, as as the show leader here and the and the one running the running thing, I should probably like you know have that shit ready. But don't. It looks like he got sent back down. Didn't do anything in the three games. They barely gave him any time. So that sucks. I mean, fuck. Really, uh, that's that's the thing where I think they need to modify these rules where these young players can and can't play. I think there should be special considerations made for certain players where it's like, okay, he's too good for this league. He's not quite there for the NHL, so let him play in this league. He'll be okay. Like, it's not a big deal. So, yeah, sadly with Shane Ray, it didn't go so well in his call-up, but at least he's, uh, you know, not all the way forgotten in in, in Seattle. Uh, the PWHL, the uh, Professional Women's Hockey League, uh, when they announced the teams and all that stuff, we were disappointed because they didn't show off the jerseys or anything. So the jerseys have been revealed and more underwhelming. So there's no logos, uh, nothing fun. They're just word marks like Toronto and stuff, kind of plain. Uh, I admittedly haven't gone out of the way to take a look at these things, but that is what I heard. And I was like, oh, fuck, well, that kind of stinks uh, apparently the quality of the jerseys don't look very good they don't look like uh may- maybe even a-, a cut underneath fanatics which you know if you have fanatic stuff which i do it's not great stuff it's it's definitely lower end quality and if the this p i mean if it's even lower than that i mean i'll cut them some slack like it's a new league and everything do you want them like dropping a shitload of cash on some prime nice jerseys maybe not but maybe a nice logo instead of just the word mark so you know it's it's a little bit disappointing but uh regardless it's I'm, I'm just happy to see that the pwhl exists so that's cool and we will finish off with sad not great news so we have new uh news coming out of the adam johnson case in the in the new england hockey league so an arrest has been made on the player that was involved uh had his skate blade uh hit adam johnson uh, he has been arrested, but there's no charge, no official charge, no trial has been set or anything. I think right now they're just doing uh, what they're supposed to do, uh, and you know, just to you know, just in case you don't want them to leave the country or something like that. In case there are some real shenanigans behind this, I honestly, I just, it's just a terrible situation. Like, you know, to. I can only imagine how bad you I would feel if I was you know, had a terrible accident and then to get arrested for it and have all these allegations and investigations going on I would feel so bad but uh, until it's all over I'm not going to put any guilt or anything like that uh, people are talking about it uh, but nothing's official but that is kind of the next page uh, in this situation ongoing, uh, in, in lighter part of that, there have been some players like Claude Giroux uh, I had seen wearing the neck guard in the NHL, so that's good. Um, it'd be nice to see guys like maybe a Connor Bedard, a McDavid, Crosby, big names, so, you know, people that a lot of young kids look up to, have those guys wear it for a game or two, maybe one, two games a week. Just try it, just to encourage the kids to do it. Like, oh, he he's doing it. And honestly, I thought Claude Giroux looked fucking cool, man, with the kind of the turtleneck. I like the turtleneck. I just didn't like when Thomas Placanix did it because I didn't like him. But, uh, yeah, no, please, wear the fucking neck guard. Nothing like that. I don't want to ever see anything like this go down ever again. So, a final piece of sad news, and that is Roman Czechmanic has passed away at the young age of 52, which is, again, very sad uh, I remember Roman Czechmanic very, very vividly. He was there on the Flyers when I first really, really heavily got into hockey. And I remember like him and Robert Esch, uh, fucking Biron. They had a lot of goaltenders. Ray Emery as well. And Czechmanic, man, I know that he didn't have a lot of success. And uh, honestly, a, a surprisingly short career for uh, some pretty nice statistics, honestly, throughout his career uh, didn't last very long. And that might have been because of the lack of playoffs, playoff success. So Roman Czechmanic might have been a goaltender if he was there in today's game. Might have been very, very successful with the way that goaltending has kind of become a 1A, 1B. So Roman Czechmanic, known for being a really, really good regular season goaltender and put up great great stats, win you a lot of games, get you to the playoffs. But when it comes to playoff time, 
kind of fell apart. Uh, so, you know, that would be a goaltender that you could pair up with a, a playoff ability goaltender and, and you can do some damage right there. But really, really sad news uh, for Roman Czechmanic to pass away. Underrated little career I would recommend. Go check it out. It's, a, it's an interesting career. A lot of shutouts put up by him in a short amount of time. So, you know, maybe if, if got to play around uh, in the NHL a little bit longer, stuck around. Could have been one of the better goaltenders, you know, maybe an underrated goaltender. So sad news to finish off with, but I think that is going to be everything for me today everybody thank you so much as always for listening you guys are awesome make sure if you want to be even more awesome hit the rate the rate the hit the like the rate you know like like the podcast like the video uh rate the thing do whatever you can help the little guy out that's always extremely appreciated you want to get involved with the podcast be my guest Drop a comment on the YouTube channel, Gamer GX Videos. These podcasts get uploaded over there. Drop a comment or anything on Twitter. Got a page over there. Link again is in the description. Send an email, email address down there as well. Send in your questions about video games, wrestling, hockey, video games, whatever, movies, doesn't matter. Send in a question. You want me to read it on the podcast? Well, we'll take some time out of the podcast and dedicate it to you and answer your question. I think that would be so much friggin' fun. And yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Speaking of fun, the upcoming GX GamerCast this week. I know we're a little bit behind this week. We got some new kitties, um, new mascots, new official mascots for the GX Plus cast uh, have been welcomed welcomed into the home this week. So we've been a little bit busy. I'm very, very happy. Uh, there's a picture of them up on Twitter if you want to go take a look at the newest mascots. They're super cute, and I love them. I love them. So that's fantastic. And with the GX Gamer Cast, looking to be talking about those uh, some hardest bosses this week. So we're going to be doing that one. And the wrestling, we're going to be doing wrestling. Of course, the recap's going to be there. we got pay-per-views upcoming. Don't think there's anything this week. But regardless, there will be content here for you. Yes, you. So stick around with the GX Plus Cast. We'll be back again with more. 